all those who have more will be given and they will have an abundance. But from those who have nothing, even what they have will be taken away. As for this worthless slave, throw him into the outer darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. The gospel of our Lord. Thanks be to God. All right. Now, <laughs> you would laugh. And I did too. Uh, there's more going on here before you skip the sense of accountability. Now, it's uh, the first lesson and even Jesus' parable have a lot of rich materials in there, including some very, very difficult words for us to hear. Unless we begin to remember that God's shalom demands accountability. Now, the question is, how are we finally accounted for? See, and that's why, as you were saying in the second lesson, there's a breath of fresh air. Uh, I was saying this last week in the uh, forum where I was talking about how Lutherans interpret the Bible, how we read it, how we understand it, how we apply it to our lives. And Luther, for all his foibles, had some marvelous things to say about how to interpret the Bible. Not everything there is for you, he said. Uh, some of our uh, very, very stringent uh, Christian friends have a hard time with that. That's okay. Well, you don't have to. We can ask good questions. And we can say, this is gospel and this is not. That's our Lutheran heritage. It's really our Christian heritage. All Christians ultimately believe it, but we, we get caught every once in a while in this desire for revenge as a way that God deals with the world, which God doesn't. But I'm getting ahead of myself. All three texts are about an ending, a final ending to all evil, to hatred, to prejudice, to violence, to killing. It's not part of God's shalom, as I was saying last week. It's not part of what God wants for the world. It's not God's dream to have hatred and prejudice and killing as a way of solving problems. It's not. Um, but for people writing the scripture, the day of the Lord, that phrase, was their way of understanding how do you bring people to justice who have done all those things, see? See? And uh, as I was saying last week, it's also a time for us to think about accountability, but with Christian heads. That accountability is necessary. No one can survive in a world where injustice is the only thing practiced. It's not what God wants. But how do we as Christians understand how that final justice, that day of reckoning happens, see? And we get a little glimpse in the second lesson, and we get a glimpse in Jesus' parable too. Okay, Jesus tells this clever and poignant story this morning. A story, did you hear me say? This was a story that I did with the kids this morning. It's a story open to lots of interpretation. You heard it. They were magnificent. Uh, put a truck in there. You know w why? Because stories are the best way to learn. And you bring to the story your own ideas. And guess what? And thank you, Martin Luther, Dr. Martin Luther, for saying the same thing about Jesus' parables, which he does. Parables are open to a multitude of marvelous interpretations, and stories often have in them, as you've told them too, things that aren't quite exactly, maybe, what God would have done. <laughs> But you're telling a story. This is a parable. Para means beside. Beside one meaning is another meaning. You don't have to force yourself to say this is about God finally, you know, killing people because they did wrong. It's a story. Be like the kids. Open up a little bit. Ah, oh, well, that could mean this. Oh, I get it. He's want to get our attention, but that could mean this. You see? Okay. In today's parable, there are those servants and the master. And uh, those servants got something for free. Am I doing all this by myself? What do I need to do? Quit turning my head. It's, it's me, I know. 
Let's try this here. What's oh, it's hitting down here? Okay, how about that? <laughs> Maybe I tuck it in here, huh? And I quit doing that. Oh, it's me. All right. There are those servants. The first two were the good ones. They invested the talents, the money, for their master. You know, one got five, one got two, and they doubled them. Well and good. There's joy in that. This is not, a, by the way, about capitalism. <laughs> but it is about investing the gifts, see? But it's that third one that did not do so well, did he? And we all, because, we, because of stories, our minds immediately go to, not a good guy. <laughs> Didn't do anything with the talents that God gave him, see? He did nothing. And there are harsh words at the end. Because he doesn't get to enter the joy. Now, here's a key. He doesn't get to enter the joy that the other two get to enter. Because he did nothing. He buried it. All right. Well, we know this business of non-follow-through, don't we? It's a slice of life. You've done it. <laughs> I've done it. Not just your sister-in-law and that neighbor you don't like and that congressman that you despise that didn't do anything with the talent the way you thought. It's a universal story. And uh, when we're honest, it's our story. Not all the time, but some of the time. But it's not useful here to do a hellfire and brimstone sermon and tell people who didn't do well, you're worthless and you're going to hell. And some of us have heard those over the years. Not real motivating. Not real helpful. Nobody does marvelous things for people they think hate them. You just don't. You're done with them. All right. I'm going to try something else down here. Let's put this up here. All right. So it's not me. I'm not the third servant. All right. I want to talk about that third servant now. Let's dig more deeply. Let's not just condemn him. Let's ask the question, a good Lutheran question, what does this mean? From the catechism. Why did the third servant not move? Why was he not getting going with his talent? Why was he stymied? Why, see? Oh, you guys are way ahead. You're just like the kids. You're way ahead of me. Our Lord loves you. All right. Yes, the reason, the reason he buried his talent was because of fear. You know. Fear immobilized him. Fear did him in. Fear is common. You know, uh, have you, like me, been in conversations with people who are talking about how the world is so awful, it's mean, it's more evil than ever before, there's rotten things that happen, and, uh, you know, you should be afraid, yes. You need to be afraid of this. Fear is reasonable, you know. Five minutes into any conversation about what people can do, Christian, non-Christian, Jews, Muslims, anybody who wants to help out the world. Five minutes in, someone says, well, you know, you gotta, you got to be careful. You could get hurt. Fear, someone will say, well, we shouldn't be afraid. Oh, yeah, but fear can save you. <laughs> we should be afraid of things like this because once you get involved, it could be over for you, see? Fear does that. Fear doesn't inspire action. Fear cuts it off. It stops it. It stymies it. And you bury whatever goodness you were going to do when you succumb to the fear-mongering of others. And we have whole groups of people in this country who live under that fear in the Christian church. Because that's their theology. That's the reason we should have theology, by the way. Uh, oh, we should be fearful. We should save our skin. But the prophets, think of Deborah, think of Ezekiel, think of Isaiah, Zephaniah this morning, Jesus, who was a prophet as well as a savior. 
None of them would say that fear is unreasonable, that we should watch our steps. They just say that it's overrated. Fear is not the only thing that we have in our lives. Fear is not the only thing that affects us. Goodness does. And risk can be really good in spite of fear. That's what the prophets are saying. Uh, have you known people who are so reasonable about life that they have no life? <laughs> safety first, we say. Oh, that's true. But sometimes safety isn't first. Have you ever thought of that? Sometimes safety, if that's all we live by, we're really the walking dead. There's no life in us. There's no initiative in us. You know, safety first. Well, who would get married if safety were first? <laughs> I say that lovingly. <laughs> Just as one example. If safety, if reasonableness, is fear, if those things are the real game of life, what kind of life? It's like a zombie life. What did Jesus say? I came that you may have what? Life. And have it abundantly. Enter the joy of your master, Jesus says. See? Because that's what it's about. A full life. A human being fully alive to all the goodness. Uh, okay. Fear belies the truth that inside of each one of you, and inside of everybody, the whole world, because the, the, uh, the goodness that Jesus brings, brings to everybody, no exceptions. And we all, and by the way, we've all been three, the, the three of these servants. Every one of us. Every person. You know, Hitler wasn't just one thing. I mean, he, he's an obvious example. But what about us, see? Uh, let's take that third servant. You know him. Uh, he's like the businesswoman who has this great dream Wants to start a business. Um, her husband <laughs> never let her <laughs> when they were married. You, you know, sometimes this happens. And finally, he's gone. That's a sorrowful thing, but it's a good thing. Now she can start a business. But uh, she says things like, oh, I don't know. I got this burning. This has happened to me, in, as people have talked to me. In my heart, I want this, but it's a harsh world. I don't know. Will I make it? Money is interesting. It can ruin you. I don't know. I want to do it, but I don't have enough money. And as she doesn't start with her new idea, she never gets it going at all. Well, there's no joy. There's a little bit of weeping and gnashing of teeth, however, as Jesus says. Or he's like that farmer. The third servant is like the farmer. He says, life is harsh. I don't know. I don't have enough seed to seed all my fields. And as he doesn't buy any more seed, he doesn't even sow the seed he has, and he has no crop. And there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. See, another way to interpret those words is a parable. Uh, the third servant is like my friend in college, a brilliant kid, by the way, full of talents, good looking, smart, uh, gracious with people but very much afraid of life, and I won't go into why. And so we were in college at the University of Minnesota that first quarter, and he dropped out at the end. He said, I don't know. Uh, he, he was smarter than me. He said, I don't know if I could make it. You know, I don't know. I'm not even sure. I'll be able to go to a trade school. Yes, I'll do that. And he doesn't do that because he's afraid of that, too. See? And he's so afraid he does nothing like this third servant. He jumps from his friend's apartments until he gets kicked out of one, and then he goes to another. Finally ended up in my apartment. I couldn't kick him out because I was a Christian, but my roommate did. <laughs> I thought of it. <laughs> but no, he was an incredible person. And one day, one day, this friend of mine, this third servant who buried his talent, met a friend. A person, see? Something outside of his head. Something outside of his analytical, always analyzing everything, but never taking a risk. A friend met him and said, Oh, you're marvelous. You are full of interesting ideas. You are smart. You are a good person. And what happened? Suddenly, something clicked. Something changed. 
And instead of bury, continuing to bury all that he had, he took a risk. He called me. He said, we got to have a brew. <laughs> and we sat down and talked about it. He was in tears of joy. He said, I I've like got a new lease on life. This person opened up the world to me. You see, fear is very reasonable, isn't it? It's reasonable. You don't get hurt as long as you stay in the fear game. But once love, this person's love in the case of my friend Mark, but in our case, God's love tells us who we really are. Beloved children of God, filled with gifts, beautiful. Everything God made, you see, every person is. The divine is in all of us. We're made in God's image. And, and we're asked to risk. You remember, the disciples had a problem with this. You know the story. Jesus is healing people, bringing people out of the margin. Joy is being found, and everyone he treats with dignity. And he heals, and he even courageously stands up against evil. And his disciples say to him, Jesus, you're so good. You're so powerful. We can't do what you do. We don't have enough faith. Remember the story? And Jesus said, oh, no, you are wrong. If you had even the amount of faith that's contained in a mustard seed, and then he looked at a mulberry tree nearby, <laughs> known for its tenacious root system, and how nothing can move, no wind could move a mulberry tree. He said, all you need is a little tiny speck. And you could say to that mulberry tree, get up and get out of here. And it would go. In my rendition. What's he saying? It's not that you don't have what you need. You got it. See? Use it, he said to his disciples. I don't have a report card on how much faith Thomas has and how much Mary Magdalene has and Peter, how much you have. Uh, uh, there's no report card. You've all got it. Get out of the fear business. What's the thing the angels always say? We'll hear it in Christmas. First thing they say when they encounter, fear not. Fear is an enemy of goodness. It you don't have to force yourself to say, well, then I don't have, I can just do anything stupidly. No. Jesus, like my good friend Steve Olson says, Jesus never said be stupid. <laughs> but fear can immobilize you for what's really important in life. And that's what Jesus is addressing here. All right. Um, he's saying to you and me, you got it. Just use it. Don't worry about how big amount you have in your life. And now I want to put out a word for Deacon Sherry and for Susan. One of the many gifts that this congregation has been given, and I could go through a long list, but it would be another sermon, and we don't, we don't get me going. But the music ministry here has enabled us, and, and don't forget this, because these two people, I've been in meetings with them. Uh, they've heard me say this. The depth of of their passion, not only for marvelous music, but for the words of the music, are so mobilizing for the Christian life and for what we're about to do. My sister was also a musician. A few years ago, she started sending me uh, music from contemporary artists. This one was written, you two will know this, I had to remember, try to remember, Carolyn Winfrey Gillette. Oh, they're nodding, of course. All right, they know. Oh, God, we yearn, we yearn for safety. That's the name of the hymn. Oh, God, we yearn for safety. You know the tune. Oh, God, we yearn for safety. We long to be secure. Yet faithful, loving service is what you value more. You give us what is needed. You love, forgive, and save. Then sending us to serve you, you call us to be brave. Okay, verse 2 is exactly this lesson. Listen. You give to some ten talents, to others two or three. To some you give one blessing, to manage 
faithfully. For you, O oh Lord, are loving and don't demand success. You daily call your people to lives of faithfulness. Don't buy into the American myth of success. <laughs> really. Uh, Jesus never uses the word. He uses the word trust, be faithful. We're asked to be faithful, not to be successful at every ministry we do. That's it. You got it. You got all the gifts you need. Yesterday is gone. Tomorrow has not yet come. Don't bury your gifts today.